Good morning. Welcome to Palm Calvary today on Pentecost Sunday. Special welcome if you were a visitor with us this morning. Also, if we were to welcome those for worshiping with us online. This morning's service will follow the service of morning praise. It begins on page 45 in the front of the hymnal. We'll turn to that order of liturgy after we've sung our opening hymn, hymn 281. We'll sing that hymn after we have, uh, the bells have been rung, and they'll be rung after we've seen the uh, June edition of the Wells Connection.
preparing young men for leadership, uh, for trade school, for college, for entrepreneurship, you name it. I plan on going to culinary school. I plan on going to Northwestern Michigan. They have a really good uh, culinary program. I want to help out students. I want to help people get the things that I wasn't able to have. I love to just give back to the future generations, basically. So MSC is a school for teachers, and it helped me keep my faith while I'm still up there. And two, I can still play football. All the things that I learned, aside from academics, like all the life lessons, teachers have taught me all the good values and principles. I'm bringing out all the things we They're starting to recognize what does it mean to live in this kingdom first and foremost. Uh, I think it's going to pay off in big ways. I think it's going to be husbands to their wives, fathers to children, um, community leaders, certainly church, you know, congregational leaders. It's going beyond just getting a diploma. It's beyond just the work that you pour in. But how are you intrinsically a better young man? But to be able to do a, a work from my heart and to continue to live towards his glory and everything that I do, like, you can't beat it, man. You can't beat it. Your personal mission statement will help you to maintain your I would dare say the first and best thing we have going for us is kingdom first, the word first, right? And after that, everything else kind of falls into place. We're doing this for Christ, and so that's where the kingdom part comes in, and though we are doing it to serve Christ, so that's what it's all about. Kingdom Prep is four years old means the first class of students has become the first class of graduates, heading out into the world to serve the kingdom. And overall enrollment at our Wells Lutheran Elementary Schools and area high schools is up 10% this year, a tremendous blessing that means thousands of additional children are hearing about Jesus every day.
hasten to save me, O God. The Spirit of the Lord fills the world. Let us worship Him. Two problems with humanity. 
one, a failure to live according to the will of God, who had wanted people to spread out and fill the earth, and the other problem, wanting to make a name for oneself rather than serving God with our time and our effort. The whole earth had one language and a single vocabulary. As people traveled in the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. They said to one another, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used mud brick instead of stone for building material, and they used tar for mortar. They said, come, let's build a city for ourselves and a tower whose top reaches to the sky, and let's make a name for ourselves so that we will not be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the people were building. The Lord said, If this is the first thing they are doing as one people, who will have one language, then nothing that they intend to do will be too difficult for them. Come, let's go down there and confuse their language, so that they cannot understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. It was named Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. This ends our Old Testament lesson. This morning's anthem will now be sung.
This lesson today is taken from Acts chapter 2, the first verse. Sometimes referred to as the first Pentecost, it is really not. Pentecost was a celebration that had been going on for centuries in the Jewish people. They called it the Festival of Weeks. Pentecost is a Greek word meaning 50. It was held 50 days after the Passover Sabbath. This, however, is probably the most remarkable Pentecost that ever was or ever will be celebrated. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the rushing of a violent wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw divided tongues that were like fire resting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, since the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak fluently. Now there were godly Jewish men from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. When this sound was heard, a crowd came together and was confused, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were completely baffled and said to each other, Look, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them speaking in his own native language? Parthians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia and of Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring in our own languages the wonderful works of God. They were all amazed and perplexed. They kept saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocked them and said, they are full of new wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and spoke loudly and clearly to them. Men of Judea and all you residents of Jerusalem, understand this and listen closely to my words. These men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. On the contrary, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is what God says will happen in the last days. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a rising cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And this will happen. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This ends the epistle lesson. We join together in our seasonal response printed in the worship folder. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in us the fire of your love. Hallelujah. We continue with the hymn of the day, hymn number 176.
rise for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel this morning, which also serves as our sermon text, is taken from the Gospel of St. John, the 14th chapter, beginning with the 23rd verse. Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will hold on to my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. The one who does not love me does not hold on to my words. The word that you are hearing is not mine, but it is from the Father who sent me. I have told you these things while staying with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I told you. <coughs> peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, and do not let it be afraid. This is God's word. Please be seated. Dear friends in Jesus Christ, our Lord, hold on tight. How often haven't we heard those words? Perhaps we heard them more when we were children. We were on our bicycle, headed down a driveway off to some grand adventure, and our mother told us to be sure and hold on tight to the handlebars. Hold on tight, said our father to his hand as we walked with him through a crowded shopping center where we could easily be separated from him and end up being paged over the internet. Would Mr. and Mrs. Wasserman please come to the service desk? There's a missing child for you. <laughs> Holding on tight is important when we're little. But it's important no matter what our age, and this morning in the word of God before us, our Lord Jesus himself tells us to hold on tight to his word. For it is through that word that God makes his home with us. It is in that word that the Holy Spirit does his work in us. And it is with that word that we have peace in our lives. Our home is probably among the most important things in our life here on earth. Whether it's a house, a condo, an apartment, doesn't really matter. But the home is the place where not only our heart is, but where we find comfort, where we get a good night's rest, where we are secure, where we get refreshment through regular meals, where families gather and discuss things both the good and the bad, where encouragement is given, where children are raised, where the word of God is brought to the hearts and minds of young people. And of all those who've ever been in our home, friends who came over by invitation, relatives who just popped in without that invitation, no one has been more important to be a member of the, house, of the home that we have than God himself. And God wants to be a part of our homes. And he does that through the word of Christ, as the Lord told his disciples. If you hold to my word, then the Father and I will come to you and we'll make our home with you. And what a wonderful thing that is, to have God as a part of our home, in our life. Not in the living room, you don't see him in the kitchen, helping himself to some of the hors d'oeuvres we've set out. He makes his home in our heart. And that's where he, of all places in the universe, that is where God Almighty wants to be. <clears throat> what a privilege that is. What an amazing thing. That he who created all things, that he who holds everything in his hand, that he who is the redeemer of all, he wants to be in our heart because we are that important to him. And so the Lord Jesus says, hold on to my word so that my father can come into the heart because that's only the, the only means by which he enters in and stays there. He cannot be found outside of his word. We don't want to look for God elsewhere. He's in the word. And so Jesus says, hold on to it. 
Now the disciples that Jesus said this to, and perhaps you noted it was John chapter 14, so this is Monday, Thursday evening after the Lord's Supper has been celebrated in all likelihood, before they've headed out to Gethsemane. So the disciples are going to be witnessing some amazing things in the next 72 hours. And then they're going to have another 40 days to see some more amazing things and hear some more amazing words of the Savior. But he wanted them to know that after he was gone, which would eventually happen, that they would not be alone, but that the Holy Spirit was going to come to them. The counselor, he calls him, whom the Father would send. And that counselor would come again in the words of Christ. On that Pentecost that we noted in Acts chapter 2, he came miraculously through in, in the flames as, as, and the wind to get the attention of people. But that wasn't the essence of the Holy Spirit. Those were just signs that he was present. He came to the disciples, he came to that crowd of people through the word of God, the word of Christ that Peter himself was preaching. Had we read further along, we'd have come to realize that that one day, about 3,000 people were added to the ranks of believers by the work of the Holy Spirit in and through the word of Christ. Now, as an aside, the word of Christ is not just the words that Christ himself spoke. The word of Christ is really a, a term we could apply to the whole of Scripture. Because Christ is the center of the book. Everything the book says has to deal with and point to Christ. And it is in that word, or through that word, that the Holy Spirit has worked in you. It first brought you to faith when the word was used with a little bit of water. It's kept you in the faith and deepened your faith and strengthened that faith, whether it was a, uh, uh, connected to some bread and some wine, or simply read or heard all by itself. And so when we are in our scriptures, reading them, hearing them, studying them, the Spirit is at work in us. It might be a passage we can say from memory, John 3.16. It might be a passage we've only heard once or twice in our life. Perhaps one of those uh, lesser known verses from the Old Testament. Doesn't matter. In either case, the Spirit is working through that word to strengthen your faith and therefore strengthen your hold on eternal life and God's hold on you. And so no wonder the Lord says, hold on tight to my word because through it, your faith will grow your certainty of salvation will increase, as will your joy. And lastly, Jesus tells the disciples that he was leaving them, but he was leaving them peace. Not like the world, gives, he said, I give you peace, but, but my peace, a different kind of peace. Ever notice when we, we close a sermon almost universally, and not just here, but you can go to any Wells church, and it always says, it seems that after the sermon, the pastor says, the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. That peace of God, the peace that Jesus leaves, is not like worldly peace, which we've all experienced, and the absence of which we've probably all experienced. Worldly peace exists in our homes, sometimes. But honestly speaking, probably not always. There are times when a spouse might be upset with their spouse, the child might be upset with the parent, the parent reciprocates and upset with the child. There's not any peace there, at least not for a few moments. Worldly peace between nations, well, that exists sometimes, but not always, we know that. History tells us that. The peace that the world offers comes perhaps through economic security. <laughs> it's not always there. And other ways too. Jesus gives us a peace far different from all of them, far better than all of them. He gives us a peace with God. The peace that allows us to go to bed every night and know that even if the day that just ended wasn't one of our best, that we weren't the gleaming light of faith that God calls us to be. 
that we were not the loving father, mother, obedient child, caring spouse that God would have us be. We still have peace with God. Because the one thing that would upset that peace with God has been taken away. And that is our skin. See, we don't have peace with God when we're financially doing well. We don't have peace with God when the kids obey us perfectly. We don't have peace with God when there's peace between our government and every other government. We only have peace with God when sin has been addressed, and in Christ it has. And Jesus wants the disciples to hold on to that truth and hold on to his word. But isn't it true, dear friends, that as we get older, we get bolder. The 12 year old boy riding down the street, look, Ma, no hands. And mother cringes. How many of you parents held the hand of your 15 year old daughter walking through the mall? How many of your 15 year old daughters wanted you to hold their hand walk? No, Mom. That's not necessary. But it looks weird, too. I'm older, I'm bolder, I don't need to hold your hand. And to be honest, I never held my daughter's hand when she was 15, and I probably didn't want to, and she probably didn't want me to, no problem. But notice what the Lord Jesus says. Not everyone is going to hold on to his word. He told the disciples to do that, but he said there are others who won't. And, and those who don't, the Father won't make their home with them. They won't have anything that they can find peace in. And isn't it true for us, dear friends? The danger, the temptation, that as we grow older, we grow bolder. I learned all that stuff about Jesus back in grade school, Sunday school, Saturday school even. I memorize passages, I can say several of them by heart if I think long enough. And I probably can get the reference right 95% of the time. So I don't hold to the Word of God too much anymore. Because I don't need to. Look, God, no hands, and off I ride into my life. Doing my own thing, going my own way. And then I wonder why I don't have peace. I wonder why I have problems. I watch the news and I wonder, why do people shoot other people in schools, in churches, in grocery stores, anywhere? Well, clearly there must be someone to blame or something. So let's take out our vengeance on the inanimate objects involved. No, the problem isn't that there are too many of these or too few of those. The problem isn't political. The problem isn't anything other than a lot of our people in our world have not held on tightly to the words of Jesus. And they go through life never saying it out loud perhaps, but saying it nonetheless. Look, God, no hands. Aren't I great? And so, when I don't hold on to the Word of God, life becomes cheap. My will becomes first and foremost in my life. Look at the folks at the Tower of Babel. What did God say? God told Adam and Eve, God told Noah and his family after the flood to fill the earth. All these smart people said, oh, no, 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 we're going to build a tower, so we stay right here. And if we ever wander too far, we'll look back, we'll see the tower, because it's so tall, we'll be able to come back. Great plan. We'll make a name for ourselves. And they let go of God's word and God's will. And it didn't go well for them. And it's caused a few problems down through history, even for us. So dear friends, even if you haven't ridden a bicycle in years, even if your parents are no longer with you to hold their hand when you're out shopping, don't let go. Don't let go of the word of Christ. 
hold on to the words of Jesus. I'm not telling you. He is. And just like your parents knew better than we did when we were kids, I think it's safe to say our Lord Jesus probably knows what he's talking about. When he tells you and he tells me, hold on to my word today and every day. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join now to sing hymn number 188. Following that, the offering will be brought forward and the prayers will be offered. Hymn 188.
In the morning, O oh Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer.
for this next school year. Uh, they're going to a five-day pre-K program for those who want. It will also allow, if some parents just want to have their children here three days, that's an option as well, but for both three-year-olds and four-year-olds. Uh, so if you have someone, a neighbor, a co-worker who has a child in that age range, or who will be that age by the 1st of September, you're welcome to take one of these little doorknob hanger flyers from the table in the back of church, pass it on to them, and they can get in contact with our school.